Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I um, am not the first one to speak because we are lucky to be here today, hosted by the Matica Hrvatska, Hrvatska Iselianika. And I may ask Mr. Knezovic, um, on behalf of uh, the head of the institute, to come and greet us as host of today's event. Please. I have to have speech in English or I, uh, Croatian is good enough? Croatian is good enough. We have Thank you. Okay. Uh, dobar dan. Pozdravljam sve paneliste i ostale sudionike skupa. Kada bih u jednoj kratkoj rečenici trebao odrediti tko su to Hrvati, vjerojatno bi se odlučio za onu koja bi rekla da su Hrvati ljudi u pokretu. I ako je ovo 21. stoljeće razdoblje sve bržeg i učestalije razmjene ljudi, dobara, informacije i kultura, onda bi Hrvati trebali biti oni koji bi trebali osobito prosperirati u ovom suvremenom dobu. I zato smatram da je Hrvatska, da je Zagreb i da su Hrvatska matice sljednika upravo sretlo mjesto, upravo pravo mjesto da raspravljamo o temama koji su vezani za toj svijet koji se se vrže i brže kreće. Osobito mi je drago da su, da su se oko ovog skupa okupile takve ugledne institucije kao što su zaklada Konrad Adenauer, Veleposlanstvo Republike Irske, Institut za razvoj međunarodne odnose, Institut Ivo Pilar, Radujem se također i konferenciji koja, je, koja će se održati sutra. I eto, pozdravljam vas u ime ravnatelja Hrvatske matice i seljenika, profesora Mije Marića, koji je to zbog unapreduzetih obaveza nije mogao ovdje prisustovati i želim sve najbolje radu ovog panela i sutrašnje konferenciji. Hvala vam lijepo na pozornosti. I may now ask to the floor director um, of Ivo Pila Institute, Professor Dr. Holjevac, please. Your, <coughs> Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a special honor and privilege to greet you at the beginning of this conference, this new Talk in Europe panel debate. I welcome you all in the same way and this uh, here we have heard it from Croatian Heritage Foundation, which is host of this conference, and having in mind that the Irish Embassy in Croatia is, a, is the co-organizer of this debate, I would particularly like to welcome the Ambassador of Ireland, Her Excellency Olive Hemstall. I warmly <coughs> welcome the Ambassador of Australia to Her Excellency Elizabeth Petrovic, as well as the Ambassador of Switzerland, Her Excellency Emilia Georgieva. Here is also, according my information, Mrs. Neda Pavic as a representative of the Mayor of Zagreb, Mr. Milan Bandic. Mrs. Pavic, welcome also to the event. I also welcome other co-organizers. The Croatian Heritage Foundation as a host of the panel, the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, the Institute for Development and International Relations, and all other distinguished guests. Having in mind the importance of European and international cooperation and promoting Talk in Europe panel debate series, the Ivo Pilar Institute is one of co organizers of this panel debate, which is dedicated uh, for the first time out of institute to remigration and circular migration as a cohesion strategy. The moderator of this debate, our scientific advisor, Karolina Horsten Tomic, has published a book, excellent book, uh, on uh, remigration to post-socialist Europe, examining the hopes and realities of return of migrants to former communist countries of Central, Eastern, and Southeastern Europe. This panel debate is an introduction to a conference on returnees and economic development, also co-organized by the Ivo Pilar Institute and hosted also by the Croatian Heritage Foundation. 
this will be today, this will be tomorrow here in uh, the Croatian Heritage Foundation. As you know, the conference is dedicated to the Croatian di diaspora potential, the Croatians as returnees and development perspectives. I wish to greet all the participants of that conference in advance and to apologize for my absence due to the Conference on Contemporary Migration in Croatia, organized by the Ivo Pilar Institute and being held at the same time tomorrow in Vukovar. This plurality of similar events these days shows the importance of migration and remigration for cohesion and development in Croatia and Europe today. On behalf of the Ivo Pilar Institute, in the hope of a successful exchange of knowledge, I wish you a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Since talking Europe is um, on many shoulders, is resting on many shoulders, we have two more partners who will take the floor. Holger Heibach, director of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, please. Carolina, thanks very much. Your Excellencies, uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps, foreign and uh, Zagreb guests, and um, everybody involved in this conference. Um, on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, I would like to thank our partners, Ivo Pila, Irmo, and also the Embassy of Ireland, and also the Croatian Heritage Foundation, who host this conference, and we are very happy to be here and um, to discuss this very important matter, not only during today, but also tomorrow. The aim of the conference actually is to bring together representative of um, emitting countries of migration and uh, recipient countries of migration to develop ideas. And I have a personal history with this subject since I worked in Africa. And my second posting for the Konrad Adenauer Foundation was in Chile. And what a lot of people don't know is Chile is the country with the most um, uh, Croatian diaspora members next to Argentina, I think, uh, but you're going to tell us a little bit more about this, uh, in Latin America. And the heritage is very palpable in, in, in economy, but also in politics. One of the first meetings that I had was with um, the longest-standing ex-scholar of Konrad Adenauer Foundation, who goes by the name of um, Esteban Tomic. His father, Radomir Tomic, was presidential candidate during the time of Allende, and he came to the country together with his, with his parents. So we have a long-standing tradition of a diaspora, not only in Germany, not only in Austria or in Australia, but also in Latin America. But we're going to discuss about this a lot more tomorrow. For now, I'm very happy to uh, welcome you all here, and I wish us a successful conference. Thanks very much. Last but not least, I may ask to the floor my colleague, Dr. Senada shelo from the Institute for International Relations and Development. Please, Senada. Hvala, Karolin. Evo, ja ću isto kratko, dragi gosti, prijatelji, kolege, zahvaljujem se da ste došli u na ovu današnju raspravu u ovo vrijeme kad je jako puno različitih događanja i aktivnosti koje svi imamo, tako da nadam se da je vrijeme dobro uloženo i da ćemo svi izaći sa inspiracijom ili boljim razumijevanjem fenomena migracije, cirkularnih migracije i svega ovog drugog o čemu ćemo razgovarati. Dakle, u zahvalu vama za prisustvo i dolazak. Želim se naravno zahvaliti Karolini institutu Ivo Pijek, Pilar, zakladi Konrad Adenauer, matici iseljenika i irskom veleposlanstvu kao partneru na današnjoj debati serije rasprava u okviru koje zovemo Talking Europe. Evo, ja dalje neću dužiti, ostajemo do kraja, razgovarat ćemo. We are right on time. This is fantastic. First of all, it's fantastic to see that this uh, hall here is full, and I think that shows how timely it is, this debate. I'm very grateful 
Olive Hempenstahl, Ambassador of Ireland in Croatia, that you brought us a, high, uh, a highly inspiring keynote speaker. I'm not yet talking about you, Martin, <laughs> just to mention before, but I'd li also like to say it was a challenge for us to do the first Talking Europe uh, this year. It's the third one in a row, but it's the first time that we go, as Director Holjewat said, out of Pillar Institute. But there couldn't be a better place than being here concerning the topic. Therefore, I thank very much once again the Croatian Heritage Foundation for hosting us. This is fantastic. I think it's also very, very um, uh, interesting and great that we are having a deepening of our today's debate tomorrow in a big conference about return migration or return and uh, economic development, which is um, organized by the um, Croatian studies and there in particular by the scientific department of Croatian studies and Dr. Jurcevic as the head of that department. Also tomorrow, um, the Institute of Migration is partner in the conference. So again, we have several shoulders to stand on. And um, I think this is a very good example of inter-institutional cooperation that we are performing here in Zagreb. Thank you also, Dr. Holjewatz, that you recognize the importance of such cooperation. So I think this is a, a big sign into the academic community, and um, I'm glad to be part of that. Talking Europe aims to break through the let's say, ivory tower of the academic world and um, to encourage debates between different sectors. That's the logic of Talking Europe. And I uh, see that international community here in, in Zagreb has recognized uh, that some impulses really come out of such debate. And this is the intention of Talking Europe, to pick up on topics which we as academics are researching but who are highly relevant for policy making and to engage with public administration as we do today with um, the uh, um, state agency for Croats abroad and um, with the business sector who will also be present tomorrow at the conference with uh, international agencies and organizations and um, yeah, with civil society at large. We need public debates. We need public debates about issues such uh, so, so yeah, important, crucial, and also medialized as is re and circular migration. Um, so with this kind of format, we try to contribute to a rationalizing of the discourse to um, yeah, maybe get a bit more calm concerning the temper and the panic and the alarmism around it and to see what actually can be done. I'm sure that many of you spend some time this weekend watching on TV the celebrations in Berlin of 30 years of the end of the Cold War and of the throwing down of the Iron Curtain of the breakthrough, the wall. For me, this was again extremely emotional. And even though we have in Germany the, the debate that the transition was something that happened in the East, it happened to all of us. We all are the generation of transition as you, as we are all sitting here in this room. We all witnessed uh, the transition and we have been yeah, seeking through it 30 years now, especially in countries of the region in Central, Eastern, and Southeastern Europe. We know that the transformation processes have been painstaking. They are still ongoing. This is not a story of success or failure, but of both. And it's also a story of ambivalences. Transition is not an easy process or the transformations that go along with it in politics, in society, economy, and in cultural life. And there are lots of controversies about it. There are so-called winners and so-called losers of transitions. We have widening gaps of those who actually made it and those who are left behind. And a lot of the political tensions we see these days in Europe not only in Europe, we know, but also in Europe, are fueled by these growing disparities within societies which we really need to um, take concern in and worry about. 
Now, migration is an example in place. Migration is not a story of successes or of failures, but it's of both, and it's highly ambivalent in particular in sending societies or in societies of origin. Now, here in Croatia, we have uh, seen emigration happening over centuries. Croatia is an emigration-trained society and has very strong international transnational links with its diaspora, as have many other countries. But in the years after World War II, with new emigration waves um, coming along, Croatia and the former Yugoslavia was unique in the Central Eastern and Southeastern European space since other countries had no facilitation, no labor migration agreements which we saw in the, in the 70s and 80s. And therefore, Croatia was really uh, in the whole of Yugoslavia and with Yugoslavia an exceptional case in Central Eastern and Southeastern Europe concerning mobility and the freedom to move and um, in going cross borders. However, we should not ignore the diversity of the Croatian diaspora and the many people who left also in opposition and dissidence to the regime but this is something we will maybe deepen the debate about later on. Um, let me say that the focus of today's debate is maybe more on the younger um, mobility and migration dynamics that we are seeing. In particular, since 2000, these dynamics are large scale, on a global level, recognizably large scale, what's happening east-west within Europe. They are predominantly concerning people of young age. So it is the people in reproductive and productive age that keep moving. And it's high skilled. And this is what gives a particular twist and also reason to the heated political debate about it and the political relevance of it, that this is a brain drain which in the long hand might be a challenge to inner European cohesion. If we really have a shift, because it leaves traces in the local economies in prospectives to growth and prosperity and lowers then the uh, chances to attract immigration, high-skilled immigration, which is desperately needed for local neighbor markets. So that is sort of the um, challenging uh, topic or frame in which we are discussing the topic of free and circular migration as a cohesion um, strategy. It is no surprise that um, we have also think tanks picking up to the topic. And now um, I will leave you with a bit um, more curiosity. I'm not going to introduce all of our panelists yet, but first of all, our keynote speaker, because um, it's highly inspiring to see what other countries who have not gone through post-socialist transformations, but who also have seen economic decline and economic recovery how they were actually handling um, the potentials of their diaspora and engaging diaspora and have worked out strategies of engaging diaspora also for economic development. But there's much, much more to it and we couldn't have a better example, I think, than Ireland. Ireland is um, not much bigger than is Croatia. It has a tremendously large diaspora and our speaker will explain us why this is so incredibly large. And now let me introduce Dr. Martin Russell. I'm very happy that you came today to Zagreb to share with us your experience. Dr. Russell made his, wrote his PhD on the contribution of the diaspora to the Irish peace process. And I think this is also highly interesting to take a look at it, also for the Croatian context. Um, so clearly an expert in diaspora engagement who is engaging in consultancies not only to his own government and um, stakeholders in Ireland but worldwide. He seems to be tra traveling more than being at home from, what the, from the impression I got. So um, you are, um, Martin is a co-founder of the Diaspora Lab, which he might say us what this is about. 
He looks into the nexus of migration and develop, uh, development globally. And you are also on the advisory board of Future of Work and Wu, Tochka Men. Maybe you are also going to talk to us about this. So, Martin, I'm very, very happy you accepted our ex uh, invitation. Please come to the floor. Thing you'll forget as, as an organizer of something like this. You, I hope, will uh, not uh, uh, keep this for too long in mind. But Olive, we wouldn't be here today if you hadn't agreed to be a co-organizer, the ambassador of Ireland, Olive Hempenstead. Please come. <laughs> Hello, and um, I really do like to begin an event with a diplomatic incident, so that was very well done, Caroline, thank you. Um, don't worry about it. Um, directors, professors, excellencies, uh, diplomatic corps, um, friends, esteemed guests, I would very like to open by expressing my sincere thanks to the Evo Peeler Institute, the Institute for Development and International Relations, the Conrad Adenayer uh, Foundation for partnering with the Embassy of Ireland today. In particular, I would like to extend my thanks to Dr. Caroline hernstein Tomic uh, for conceiving of the Talking Europe initiative, and secondly, for thinking of Ireland and its diaspora experience as an example that could usefully be shared with a Croatian audience, a conviction which I share. Why do I share this conviction? Well, Ireland and Croatia are both small countries, as Caroline said, with populations under five million. We both have experience of emigration as a factor in our histories and in our present. We both have diaspora that exceed the population of our home countries, and we both emphasize having a very strong relationship with this diaspora. In Ireland's case, we deeply value our connection with Irish people living overseas. This includes Irish citizens who have made their homes outside of our island, but also those of more distant Irish heritage with whom we enjoy a unique and cherished relationship. The scale of this global Irish family is truly impressive. By the most recent estimates, over 70 million people around the world claim Irish heritage, while 1.5 million Irish citizens currently live overseas. It is these two groups that my ministry collectively define as the Irish diaspora. The largest Irish diaspora is well known and is located in America where approximately 33 million people identify as Irish. There are other large historical diaspora populations in Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. Recent immigration trends indicate that there are growing Irish diaspora communities in many larger EU member states, in the Gulf states, and in Asia. It must be acknowledged, however, that the Irish community in Croatia remains small but vibrant. We have around 70 people registered with us at the embassy. We do, however, have some famous um, diaspora members from the past that lived in Croatia. Some of the Croatian people in the audience might know of Laval Nugent, who famously lived here in the 1700s and owned quite a bit of property. So I regard him as the first real estate investor in this area. Um, we also have had um, um, we also, Croatia has also had, have, has had the pleasure of having James Joyce live here for eight months. Um, and in fact, when he left Ireland um, and eloped with his, um, with his future wife, Nora Barnacle, uh, Croatia was the first place where he landed. Famously, he didn't particularly like it, but as I often observe, he didn't particularly like Ireland either. Over several years, the Irish government has developed a wide range of policy mechanisms aimed at supporting and deepening our engagement with the diaspora. The biggest change in recent time was the creation of the Minister of State for the Diaspora in 2014. This was 10 years after we opened the unit in our department. 
This role appointed a minister with the express remit of engaging with the Irish overseas. The current Minister of State for the Diaspora is Minister Kieran Cannon. His work is supported by my department, the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, which administers the Irish government's diaspora initiatives. At the heart of our engagement with emigrants overseas is the Emigrant Support Programme. This is a global funding programme which is aimed at supporting Irish organisations overseas with their work with the diaspora. This year, over 12.5 million euro of funding will be granted to organisations which support the welfare of Irish immigrants and Irish communities abroad. It also provides funding to bodies that promote Irish culture, to networks connecting Irish business professionals abroad. We also have an interdepartmental committee, as all governments do, um, which works on the Irish abroad. And their specific remit is to assist people um, who wish to return to Ireland to make it less, to, to remove impediments and to examine what are the difficulties that they face when they decide to return to Ireland. The Irish government is currently working on introducing a new diaspora policy in early 2020, which will aim to further deepen our engagement with the Irish overseas. A wide ranging public consultation was undertaken on that policy, and I believe it's still ongoing. Which brings me to our guest lecturer today. It may surprise you to know that he's also from Cork, but that has nothing to do with the fact that he is here today. Um, I am also a Cork um, woman. Um, we're delighted to have Dr. Mar Martin Russell here with us. He is regarded by the department as one of our foremost thinkers on diaspora issues. Dr. Martin Russell completed his PhD on diaspora studies at the Clinton Institute at University College Dublin. He is a visiting fellow at many institutes and sits on many networking boards and diaspora think tanks around the world. Most recently, he was advisor to iDiaspora, the UN Agency for Migration, a global knowledge hub on diaspora involvement. He has trained, spoken, written on diaspora engagement in Africa, the Caribbean, Central Asia, Central and Latin America, Europe, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Uh, clients include a range of public and private sector entities, such as my department, but also UK bodies and USAID, um, several in international institutions like the World Bank. He has authored several diaspora strategies and policies globally. Today, he will speak to you on the do and do nots of Irish diaspora engagement. Ireland's diaspora policy in a global context. I'm interested in hearing both aspects of this lecture, as it is important to try as much as possible to learn from our mistakes as much as building upon our successes. I am also very much looking forward to a wide-ranging and interesting panel discussion following this presentation. Havala. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> we can do better than that. Good evening. Good evening. Right, a bit, bit of energy. And just get the PowerPoint up, if possible. Uh, perfect. First of all, it's great to be here. And I want to say thank you to the organizers and most importantly, the ambassador and the, the Irish government for facilitating the visit. I come from a part of Ireland where we're blessed with a really strong accent. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to speak slowly. But this is for the translators. If you, if, if you do not understand, just bang the window. <laughs> right? Look, what I want to do today is, is to give you, and I, the best way to, to, to contextualize this is that the best compliment I was ever given was that I'm a reluctant academic. Right? So I want to talk to the academics in the room, but I also want to talk about how you apply some of the knowledge that we learn in the classroom. So I think it fits well with the remit of Talking Europe. So when Irish people first emigrated, the ambassador didn't mention this, and in the spirit of diplomatic incidents, when Irish people first emigrated, we got a nickname, and it was called Mix, right? But we gave out so much, there was a saying, never give a Mick a mic, right? So you've been very brave to give me the microphone. So I'm going to tell you some stories. I'm a reluctant academic, so there will be questions. So hopefully you will all listen as I go. But what I want to talk to you about is how to go about this, what Ireland has done well, what we need to improve on, 
I'll also give you some tips about what not to do, and also some tips on what's next in terms of diaspora engagement globally. So if we look at the presentation, it has three aims. To provide context to the rise of interest in diaspora engagement, to provide an overview of Ireland's diaspora engagement model, and global examples of excellence. I should never say this as an academic, and I'm going to get in trouble from the academics in the room saying this, but I'm a founding member of a group called CASE, C-A-S-E. Does anybody want to have a guess what that stands for? Copy and steal everything. <laughs> in academia, it's called plagiarism. You cannot do it. But in diaspora engagement and consultancy, it's a clever strategy. So we're going to look at what's happening globally as well, particularly three countries to give you an insight of what they've done. And then I'm going to, as I say, look at what's coming next. So if we click, the rise of interest. Let me go back. The rise of interest. This tells me a lot about the personality of the people I'm speaking with. Do you want the good news first, or do you want the bad news first? Good news. Good news. The good news is, is that the level of interest from governments, international agencies, private sector, philanthropic foundations on diaspora engagement has never been higher. It's a booming, booming industry. Now, we have challenges within that. I would argue that the sector as it stands today is not that professional yet. There's nowhere realistically you can go at a global level to study this topic at a top class level. It's very difficult to talk to somebody early to mid-career and tell them this is your career in diaspora engagement. So that's the good news. The level of interest is at an all-time high. The bad news, most diaspora engagement does not work. But think about that for a minute. Despite all this failure, <laughs> the level of interest is booming. Right? So there's something magical in the topic. I want to tell a story that cultivates this and communicates this. And this is a true story. In the early 20th century, a scientist made his famous discovery. He went on a speaking tour across Europe. Same driver bringing him around. After about 20 talks, the driver said to the scientist, with all due respect, professor, I've heard you give that talk for the exact same 19 times. I think I can give the talk. So the professor said, no problem. Went into the next city. This is before technology, before pictures. Everybody knew, nobody knew what they looked like. The driver went up and gave a tour de force performance. Standing ovation. What happens at the end of a talk? Questions and answers. So the hands went up. Questions. And the driver, thinking on his feet, said, you know what? Those questions are so simple. My driver is sitting in the audience tonight, <laughs> and he'll be able to answer those questions. <laughs> And I think that's where we are at diaspora engagement. Everybody talks a good game on this, but very few people have the track record, of, track record of impact. So that's the challenge ahead for the sector. And why does diaspora matter for migration? Migration, whether we like it or not, is toxic. People do not want to talk about it, right? Public and political confidence on the topic is at an all-time low. I won't cause too many diplomatic incidents, but we're on an island off, an island off the edge of Europe and our neighbour on the other side of the <laughs> pond is going through some interesting issues on migration as well. But here's the beauty of diaspora. Not many people know what it means. We have a joke that the diaspora sounds like two tablets you take for a headache. Right? But there's power in that lack of definition. We need to shape the narrative and the understanding of diaspora to be a powerful force of good for migration. We need to stand up and be courageous on migration. There's not, ma there's not many courageous leaders on migration at the moment, so that's the challenge. This is my favourite quote. I told you there will be questions. This was written in the last 10 years on diaspora engagement from an Armenian academic. And the quote reads, Homeland governments and international organisations have quite clumsily sought to develop means to attract more investment and remittances, sell bonds to the diaspora, and generally direct the political and economic capital of diasporas. My question is, what's the most important word in that quote? Clumsily. Everybody gets that this is a good idea. <laughs> the trick is in being professional about how you go about it and building it systematically through process. So what does it mean 
and, and we mentioned this over lunch. We live in a world where, look at what's happening around us. Power is still important, whether we like it or not. Connotations, understanding, and retaining power is important. So this is a professor at Harvard, Joseph Nye, who talked about the world has now gone away from a snookered billiards table model of the great military mites bouncing off each other. Hard power. More recently, we're in the context of soft power, where the quality of your ideas influences people. And it's evolved again now to, to, to notions of smart power. And smart power is people-to-people -people power. Right? It's about networks of affluence and influence. The next slide is a lady at, at Princeton, if we can get it going. And her whole man mantra is that we're now living in the networked age, where the measure of your power is your connectedness. Now, if you think of it for a country, a city, organization, or whatever it is, the greatest convener of connectedness are your people. That's the same as it is for a country, as it is for a company, right? So we are now in the age of people power. So the measure of your power is your connectedness. And if you think about technology and where we're going, diasporas now have capital and have power. First thing I was taught as a young academic, before you talk about anything, define it. Definition, definition, definition. So I see diaspora capital as flows of people, ideas, and finance for a city, organization, country. I argue that sports teams have diaspora. My favorite soccer team had a lot of Croatian players back in the day. Luka Madrik, Bedrin Charluka. I spend so much money following that soccer team that I see myself as part of their diaspora. I don't live where they're from. <laughs> I travel in and spend. So think about how you define your diaspora. Because if you have an inclusive definition, different types of engagements will allow you to segment it and build target groups. And of course, people are getting attracted to this topic because of big numbers. Rise of international migrants, remittances. The number one reason why most governments want to do this is economic development. I get that. The debate over the last 12 to 18 months is remittances. How do we get it into investment? Right? Remittances, consumption, investment, a bit more sustainable. Nobody's figured that out, <laughs> by the way. There's been a lot of money spent in it, but nobody's figured it out. So that's the rise of interest. The global Irish policy. I am shamelessly proud to be Irish, because I think the Irish government do an incredibly good job in this. I was joking over lunch with the ambassador that I see us in the top three in the world. I have a very simple vision for my career, to help establish Ireland as the best in the world on diaspora engagement. I want us to be a center of excellence for this teaching, training, and research on diaspora. Nobody is grabbing it yet. So the global Irish policy, the pillars, support, connect, facilitate, recognize, evolve. Look at the vocabulary. The vocabulary is soft. My heart breaks when I read a policy and he said, we want to harness the diaspora. We want to tap the diaspora. They're not an animal. <laughs> They're communities, right? You want to support them, connect them, facilitate them, recognize and evolve them. Within that, when you look through, let me get this going again. I might flip through, but if you look through the biggest, and I'll give you some examples of why the Irish diaspora engagement model works well. Particularly three or four. Role of government is the big question. What is the role of government in diaspora engagement? Number one, do you want to implement or do you want to facilitate? Right? A lot of countries like to implement. I would argue that the powerful role of government in diaspora engagement is to be the facilitator. Light and touch, as Professor Menu called it. We also have a hybrid public and private partnership model to what we do. The Irish government cannot be expected to go it alone on this. It will need partners. So the Emigrant Support Programme that the Ambassador mentioned is a core example of that. Work beyond that. Who should own diaspora engagement? If you invest in building the network infrastructure of your diaspora where they are, they can own it locally through the facilitation model. That takes time. 
And most importantly, it takes trust. So when you work through those issues, the question driving all this is what is the role of government? So what's the future of the Irish diaspora policy? I've given you the good news, what we do well. And it just breaks my heart to say, and I'm going to whisper it, because I might, I might get chased out of the room. <laughs> no, no. Diaspora at the moment, for many countries, is not that important. Right? If you think about where diaspora fits in the migration and development nexus, migration is a hell of a lot big top, bigger topic than diaspora is. So we have to make sure that diaspora is coherent to where they want to go in terms of your wider developmental vision. So what's the purpose of what you're trying to achieve? Right? I would argue that for Ireland, it's about care, community, and culture. Right? Very simple messaging there. And of course, commerce. Right? But you have to earn the right to get to the point of the commercial discussion with your diaspora. You can't assume just because they're there, they're a diaspora, they want to invest back, <laughs> that they want to give back. You know, and there's an old trick, I'm quite cynical because I have a background as a fundraiser as well. <laughs> you know, people will never give to your cause. People will never give to your organization. People will never give to your country. People will give to people, right? We do a lot of giving in our private lives. We give to people, right? And that's important to understand. Other countries to look at. Question number two. Who else do you think does diaspora engagement really, really well globally? Shout some names, countries. Israel, Israel historical. Yeah. India. Anywhere else? China. China. Anywhere else? Poland. Poland. Emerging. The two I'm going to focus on have been mentioned. India and China. Their success globally is not by accident. The trick in diaspora engagement is putting it front and center of your foreign policy. Right? And later I'll show you some slides if you want of Modi in the UK at Wembley Stadium. He was close to selling out Wembley Stadium quicker than the English football team. He was close to selling out Madison Square Garden quicker than the New York Knicks. Right? Did the same in Sydney. China. Look at the FDI going into China. And people talk about the emergence of China. This is the re-emergence of China, if you go back into the historical books long enough. So what have they done well? Right? They've built an engagement. Let's take the Indian model. Why does it work? The number one barrier to diaspora engagement is a lack of trust. So in 2002, and I know this has been recorded, so I'll be sensitive with my vocabulary. <laughs> in 2002, India realistically had one relationship with this diaspora. India did not like its diaspora, and its diaspora did not like India. So the Indian government said, we're going to go out and we're going to talk to our diaspora. So they created a committee. They spent a couple of years talking to the diaspora. They wrote a report. It's 700 pages long. It's available online. Don't read it all. Do the academic trick. Read the introduction. Read the conclusion, and you'll get a good sense of what's in it. <laughs> right? And they went back and they started to initiate some reforms, not everything. Now, they were told some tough things, I can imagine. They were probably told you're overly bureaucratic, we don't trust you, probably told they were corrupt in many ways. So when they went back, they began to change a little bit. Within 15 to 20 years, I would argue now that India are the best in the world on diaspora engagement. Right? Phenomenal, phenomenal story. Case, copy and steal everything. Look at India. Right? Let's look at China. And I'm going to give you a country to look out for. Where do you think the future of diaspora engagement is? Africa? Caribbean? The country to keep an eye on. And partially because they have this, they have this superhero rock star called Usain Bolt, is Jamaica. If you look at what Jamaica are doing on diaspora engagement, it's phenomenal, right? Beginning to build sow the seeds. So what I want to get across is that this is about a process. And most importantly, within that, the government is only one cog of that wheel, right? The great powerful story about the Irish diaspora story from the government perspective is facilitation. Now, I can share with you hundreds of stories, hundreds of initiatives, 
some Irish, some other. You talk about the Global Irish Economic Forum, the Global Irish Network, the Gathering, an incredible diaspora tourism initiative. They need partners to bring that to the table. But this is a process. So how do you do it? And somebody please stop me in about five minutes because I want to make sure we have a conversation rather than talk all along. How do you do it? I see diaspora engagement, particularly at a policy and strategic level, as having four key pillars because the sector is not developed enough to go beyond this. It can happen four ways. Institution building, you need to look internally at how you build the institutions that will facilitate. So in Croatia, you have the, the state office for Croats abroad. You build internally. Then you look at human capital. So we talked about brain drain, brain drain and the flows of talent and so on and so forth and bringing them back. That comes second. Then you look at the economics and the final pillar is on supporting your diaspora. So we can, if we just quickly flip through. We'll... Before you get to that, the key question is, and I mentioned at a policy level, is some questions to really think about. What do you want to stand for? What are your value systems? I'm going to hazard a guess, because I've been lucky enough to sit in some government rooms, some private sector rooms, some foundation rooms, mostly at a board level. I'm going to hazard a guess that the winners in the future will think long-term and will think more about their value systems than the people that are working in the short-term and thinking about their transactions. What you stand for is really, really important, okay? So there are the four pillars of a diaspora policy, institution building, human capital, economic, supporting your diaspora, all right? What do you need to bring that to life? You need to be an academic. Whether you, whether, I said I'm a reluctant academic, but you still need to be an academic. You need people around the room that can think about topics at a complex level and approach them in a complex level. One of the most powerful sentences that was uttered to me about a year and a half ago was a friend of mine who works for a very prominent American bank. And I was in Boston playing the Irish card, <laughs> getting in to meet people, and I said, what's your big challenge? I said, what's your big challenge coming down the road? He said, Martin, staff. He said, people. I said, but you must have people beating a path to your doorway wanting to work for this bank. He said, Martin, you don't get, you don't get it. He says, we don't want people with a finance background in this bank anymore. We want the English graduates. We want the arts graduates that can think about the world in a complex way. We can teach them the finance. <laughs> right? Really clever way of thinking about where the world is going. So for your diaspora policies, you need to have that academic critical mindset of how you frame this, how you measure it, how you evaluate it, how you build it through that system. You need to be, whether you like it or not for a lot of countries, you need to be an entrepreneur. A lot of diaspora policies sit on shelves because a lot of money is spent in writing them, but very few people think about the budget to implement them. Right? So you have to be con constantly thinking implementation, budget, budget, budget. So you need to figure out how to make that a reality. You need to be a connector because you need to bring the people around you that need, that need to happen. So they're the skill sets that you need. Right? So tips. The do and do not. I've touched based on some of the do's, right? But now I want to talk about the do nots. The number one reason why diaspora fails is fuzzy mats. Great American phrase, fuzzy mats, and the big numbers. The amount of times I hear, we have five million in our diaspora. If we get 10 bucks a month, or if every member of our diaspora, <laughs> this country is fixed. <laughs> the world doesn't, look, doesn't work like that. Go, uh, the first thing I say to them is, Go ask them for the 10 bucks. <laughs> let, let me know how you get on. <laughs> right? So fuzzy mats draws people in. Don't get attracted by the big numbers. Let me say something very softly, very diplomatically, but it's true. You can have 5 million in your diaspora, but the right five people can change our country. I come from working in Irish academia, now in the private sector, still working in academia. We had a guy called Chuck Feeney. Anybody in this room ever heard of a guy called Chuck Feeney? Philanthropist. Philanthropist. Two hands went up. He gave billions to Irish academia. What he did for Irish academia was phenomenal. So this is the difficulty in diaspora engagement, and I get in trouble when I say this. You have to rank your diaspora, whether you like it or not. You have to figure out what are their capacity and what are their propensity, right? So don't get attracted by the big numbers. You know, the big numbers has probably led to the failure. 
This might get me in trouble here, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> the myth of return, right? Particularly if you have successful people abroad that have gone abroad, fell in love, had a mortgage, got married, had children, and you're saying, come back to Croatia for six months. <laughs> come go back to Croatia for 12 months. I would hazard a guess the majority of them are very happy to look at helping Croatia, but they'll do it from where they are. People that have been successful and talented, they can do more for you out there than they can do back here. And a lot of governments seem fascinated by the need to get them physically back. It's messy, <laughs> to be frank. I think the biggest mistake you can do is look at your diaspora as solely financial. Diasporas smell it. They smell it. You know, and here's the beauty of it. They're so clever, they'll give you a bit, <laughs> but you'll never get the great prize for your country. If you're insincere in your engagement, like any walk of life, people see through it. They can smell it. Trust is the big one. We mentioned this already. The big thing that a lot of governments say, and I'm going to talk about, I'm going to close with the four steps to make this a reality. A lot of people say we need to map our diaspora. I say point me to a country that has done this well. Right? And I mentioned the country earlier, Jamaica. They spent a lot of money trying to do this. Didn't really set the world alight. Because here's the difficulty. Most diasporas do not trust government. Right? And if we're realistically, most governments probably don't trust diaspora. <laughs> to be honest, so you need to figure out where's that data, who has it, how are you going to cluster it? And this is where the private sector is really important. Diaspora use airlines, hotels, Visa card, MasterCard. They have, they have the data on your diaspora already. It's about getting to them and, and, and networking it. You have to see your diaspora as disaggregate, and as I said, you need to professionalize the sector. Before I get to that, I want to talk to you about the four-step process. I'm a convert to this. When a mentor of mine first talked to me about this, I just thought I was skeptical, <laughs> to be frank. But then I began to apply it, and it works. So I see diaspora engagement as a four-step process. Research, cultivation, solicitation, stewardship. Research at a different level, and there's diff different types of data and profile you built. Coming back to ranking them, who are they, where are they, what are they doing, for the purpose of, what, of why you want to engage them. Right. Cultivation, listening. Rule number one in diaspora engagement, listen to your diaspora. They will tell you what they want to do. Don't tell them what you want them to do. You know, there's a great line from Kennedy, you know, ask not what your country can do, but you can do for your country. Ask not what your diaspora can do for you, but what you can do for your diaspora. Give to them before asking to get back. Solicitation is the ask. And when I talked about solely financial, and being almost cynical and horrible in your <laughs> engagement. Most people in this world, and this is for your own per personal development as well, forget about the diaspora for a minute. <laughs> if you're in life for a transaction, talented and quality people see right through it. Right? So people that do the transaction stop at solicitation. They make the ask, they get, they stop. Right? The great networkers, the great examples of diaspora engagement always include the final step, which is stewardship. And stewardship is about saying thank you five times in five meaningful ways. If you have done all the hard work to convince somebody to give to you, whether that's for your organization, your charity, your country, your job is to retain them, not take them for granted. Because diaspora is led by, people are familiar with the 80-20 rule in business, diaspora is 99-1. 99% of your success will come from one or two people. So you have to retain them. So I close by saying, where do we go next? And this is what I love about where we began, where the measure of your power is your connectedness. As I mentioned, I come from an island off the edge of another island, <laughs> off another big thing called Europe. Ironically, over the last couple of years, Ireland has probably been one of the most powerful small countries in the world. <laughs> Think about it for a second. Right? Why is that? Our connectedness. So we're now entering in a new age of commercial diplomacy. Commercial diplomacy has always been there, but there's geopolitical shifts happening here where diaspora and commercial diplomacy is really important and what they bring to the table, and most importantly, who they bring to the table. We've talked a lot in preparation of this event about affinity diaspora. 
Some of the greatest advocates for, for Croatia out there may not have been born in Croatia. So it's about who they bring to the table with them. I'm a big believer in philanthropy, so I'll, I'll finish on that in a moment, and the private sector. There was a great line recently told at a conference in Dublin by the CEO of a major car company. He said, the global war for talent is over. Talent has won. Right? The number one challenge for most companies, most multinational companies in the world, is not the attraction of talent, it's the retention of talent. And if you want to look at the best diaspora engagement model out there, diaspora is not in the name. It's the US Ivy League alumni engagement model. Exact same model. You need to build the engagement across the masses, so whether that's tourism, culture, heritage, whatever it is. And for that top tier, you need a microscopic engagement. So whether that's to build a new foundation building, <laughs> whatever it is moving forward. So I want to finish with philanthropy. Have people read about this, the intergenerational transfer of wealth? And this is the cynical private sector guy in me, right? In diaspora engagement, US Ivy League alumni model, they have a great phrase. Everybody's good at getting the ducks in the row. We're really, we're really good at knowing when to shoot. <laughs> you have to shoot where the ducks are in diaspora engagement whether you like it or not. So the intergenerational transfer of wealth, this is a report by Accenture a couple of years old. Can't understand why people haven't picked up in more detail. And this is the US alone. But if you look at the demographic trends elsewhere in Europe, it's gonna happen across Europe as well, particularly Germany. In the US, by 2050, which is not that long away, there will be 33 trillion, that's the aliens with a TR <laughs> before it, big number, 33 trillion in financial and non-financial assets transferred intergenerationally, right? So when we talk about diaspora engagement, the rise of interest from international agencies and so on and so forth, a lot of that is immigrant wealth. So I'm gonna finish with a story. That money can go to three places. First thing they can do is give it to their kids, right? Really interesting thing about successful people. Like to give their kids enough. Won't give it all. They feel like it will ruin them, right? Warren Buffett has a great line in this. And pardon the vulgarity, but it's his line, not mine. My kids are part of the Lucky Sperm Club. My kids are part of the Lucky Sperm Club. Right? And he's a big believer in this, is that where you're born and who you're born to has an exponential impact on where your life can bring you. Right? So his kids will get some, but they won't get a lot. So you still have a big pocket of wealth. Second thing they can do in the US is pay taxes on it. Really interesting thing about successful people do not like to pay taxes. <laughs> so you still have a huge pocket of wealth. Third thing they can do with it, and this is morbid, but stick with me. Have you ever seen a coffin with a roof rack? You can't bring your money into the ground with you, right? So universities, foundations, libraries have all clicked this. This is the tranche of developmental finance that the world is looking for, right? And the really interesting thing in the US, for example, a lot of it is diaspora wealth. So look, I commend you on the work ahead. Apologies that we didn't get a, a smooth process with, with the PowerPoint, but this is my final message. Your diaspora can be a key driver of your developmental vision and mission, but you need to inspire them, right? Don't bore them, make it fun. Inspire them and invest in them. This is not about transactions. Build networks and relationships that matter. These will prosper over time. Time is important. Think long term. All right? The winners in the future will be thinking long term. Thank you for your attention. Happy to answer any questions, and hopefully that wasn't too bad. <laughs>
Croatiana um, has, is a legal expert and has, uh, before she joined the office, the URED has worked in the Ministry of Labor and Pension Systems of uh, the Croatian Republic. So um, interesting work experience here. Croatiana was also uh, grown in the United States, which in a moment you will maybe talk to us about. Um, Mrs. Alida Vracic is the director of the Bosnia-based think tank Populari, currently a fellow at the Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna in the Europe's Future program, which is sponsored by Erste Foundation, also a visiting fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, which was partner in the first of the Talking Europe rounds. A uh, focus of uh, Alida's work is on European integration of the Western Balkan region and a work which is uh, highly in demand and still ongoing. And uh, you have quite a number of merits in this, which is shown in um, the many scholarships you have received. I can't even um, mention all of them. <laughs> you have a Master of Science in International Public Policy at the University College of London, a BA from Sarajevo Law School, also a lawyer at the panel, and a BA from the Executive Education Program of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Welcome, Alida. Thank you so much. Last but not least, Remus Angel, Dr. Angel is a colleague of mine we have worked for many years, a senior researcher at the Romanian Institute for Research on National Minorities and director of the Center for Comparative Migration Studies at the Babish Bolai University in Cluj-Napoca. Focus of Mr. Angel's work is on migration and ethnic studies, on migrant transnationalism and return. And um, yeah, recently, or already some time ago, finished his habilitation in sociology at the Babish Bolai University and has a PhD in sociolo sociology at the University of Bielefeld. Welcome, all of you. I'm very, very happy that you accepted to be with us. Croatiana, you as also part of the hosts here, since we are in Zagreb, are the first one who I would like uh, to share a few of your insights, both personal, but also professional on the topic of return. Does return happen? Does it matter? What should we know about return and remigration to Croatia? Well, uh, uh, I would first like to thank uh, Professor Russell for a great presentation. I'm really glad to see my boss here uh, to hear all of these great and en en enlightening uh, moments that you have uh, introduced us all with. Uh, return happens, I'm a returnee. So, and I know a lot of returnees that uh, returned to Croatia in the period of the 90s from diaspora, for, uh, from uh, overseas countries, and uh, we even had a high school a class in high school that were the mainly uh, uh, kids from the diaspora because it was a language high school and um, the courses were, some courses were held in English. So returnee, uh, ret returns uh, happen, and but they always happen with a reason if they are massive. Uh, that's uh, something that uh, is really hard to explain to, uh, to public that you cannot force what the uh, professor said, uh, diaspora are not animals. You cannot have organized returns unless there is a crisis situation in a country and that's the only way you can have an organized return uh, to uh, the homeland. But, uh, or if there is a big shift in the country, in the homeland, it's inspiring for a return. So that's uh, what, uh, about organized return. What the country can do and what Croatia is doing is building itself uh, in Croatia. We are having um, economic growth. Uh, that's something that's two years, uh, the last two years, we just get the investment uh, uh, rating. Uh, and these are moments that are, uh, that are inspiring for uh, people from the diaspora to return to Croatia. Uh, so the institutional system is working uh, better than it was before. And uh, what uh, the professor said at the beginning of the presentation, uh, branding, uh, the soft power of branding is really important in diaspora um, return. Uh, Croatia has, uh, through sports and tourism, it uh, gained visibility 
uh, globally. And people uh, through tourism, are, Croatia is branded as a lifestyle, a lifestyle country. And through tourism, uh, the members of the diaspora, they have to ask themselves during the summer season, if it's a lifestyle destination, why not bring the life here? Uh, and that is something that is happening. And the other motivations for the return, which is happening, uh, we don't have numbers in Croatia. And I don't like to talk about a, uh, a trend or a tendency or, uh, I, we just see the uh, volume of the, our work in the office uh, in the last two or three years. We, it's multiplied in terms of returnees. So it's something that is practical and visible to us uh, daily. And uh, their primary, uh, the primary reason uh, the return is happening and what is being recognized in the Republic of Croatia by the returnees is the safety factor. And that's funny because in 1991, when I returned from New York, uh, the same reasons I was, and I'm still thankful, uh, eternally thank thankful for my parents for making the decision to return to Croatia, uh, the same reasons that I was so happy about uh, with coming back to Croatia is, are the reasons that the new uh, returnees are happy about. It's the safety, it's the quality of life, uh, the connecting with people. Croatia is all about relations, and we have really good relations. We are connected uh, as families, as a society. And the quality of life because of that is something that is it's hard to be, uh, it's hardly achievable in countries which do not have a work-life balance like the one that is existing in Croatia. So first the safety, then um, Croatia has a really uh, good uh, school system, uh, university system, and its costs are uh, much, uh, it, uh, it's lower costing than the ones in the Western states. We have the um, access to me uh, medical institutions, which is also a lot lower in cost. And uh, the final uh, thing is the life-work balance. And I've heard uh, in um, last year in a really good discussion with a highly ranked uh, returnee in the private sector. Uh, he said uh, the best sentence ever. In the West, you have to sacrifice uh, the life balance and the safety, uh, of, but you gain financial stability and predictability. In Croatia, you earn less, but you learn more. And it sums it up the best. Mm -hmm. That's the motivation for all these young families that are daily coming into our office from Latin America, from Northern America, uh, mainly from uh, Latin and Northern America. And we, you, that's the most beautiful part of my work. So uh, thank you. So there is return happening, even if it's not uh, huge in numbers, but um, it's clearly also part of the branding of the country since uh, people who return give good reasons why quality of life is uh, a good argument for actually establishing family lives here. What is the um, state agency doing a part of um, in, yeah, or encouraging return and taking care of people who do want to return in terms of outreach to diaspora? Uh, well, uh, the world, we have a welcoming office in the state office and its main com competency is to help the potential returnees and the returnees that are already here to uh, help them communicate with uh, state institutions, with admin uh, admi uh, administrative procedures that are often uh, complex in Croatia and not uh, understandable uh, enough for them to be um, easily uh, gone through it, uh, go through, through it. So uh, that is one part of the uh, state uh, office for Croats abroad uh, part of the return process. The other part of the process is uh, to communicate. I really enjoyed the presentation because um, it pointed out so well what everybody is doing uh, wrong. <laughs> and it's, um, Croatia is doing one thing right. We are uh, firm believers in case. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we call it, uh, we are analyzing best practices. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what we are doing right now. Uh, we have um, 
we are concentrating on the best practices and we are not forcing uh, engagements with the diaspora in uh, terms that the government is doing something uh, which is explicit or um, involving uh, them in any way which needs financial support mm. or no, we're not uh, asking for anything, we're just cooperating and our Basic strategy is not to force return or the idea of return. You're forcing the idea of cooperation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Alida, you have been uh, doing some research and um, also published uh, interesting reports about the re uh, research in the Western Balkan regions. And um, in order to first track the flows of um, also return migration, but also out migration, you came across the huge problem of statistics and numbers, which you might also give us a short glimpse into. But I'm also very interested about your take on uh, Martin's uh, presentation here and what's in there, what he's been talking about, um, Ireland's uh, global Ireland strategy, what's in there for the Western Balkans or also here for Croatia, what should we actually copy? Please. Many thanks. This is super inspiring given the fact that I'm actually doing research on emigration from the Western Balkans for like four years now and I see that the topic is now getting into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to discuss this. It's opening up also in terms of diaspora engagement. But I can assure you that in the Western Balkans four years ago, this was a no topic. Mm. There was no single government in the region that wanted to engage, to break through into this topic, to admit that we have an issue with high levels of emigration, and this is slowly changing. Um, as for the Irish experience, I was in Ireland, of course. I mean, that's the first stop you cannot possibly avoid it. And I've spent some time, and I even published some papers on it, trying to really see what's replicable. What are the experience of, experiences of Irish diaspora, 70 million? And what can be actually, uh, what are the, the best lessons, most immediate lessons for the Western Balkans? And uh, I've, he I've heard so many times this copy and steal thing throughout actually my trip uh, to, to Ireland that I realized this is, this is certainly a way to go. But there are also some more specific issues that one can take. I will go back to that, but let me just uh, tackle an issue on, on, on the statistics, and I would uh, maybe take a little bit somewhat critical uh, a view on, on what Kratiana said. Um, in the beginning, I don't think we're yet there. Maybe the agencies here and there are doing something, but this is a very, very beginning. This is an infancy phase. Uh, at the moment, as we speak, Serbia is trying to open up uh, something called Agency for Circular Migration. There are sporadic efforts in the region, but very much at the beginning, and I, I think they're also uh, envisaged in a way that is not necessarily very holistic. We're not connected with universities, we're not connected with institutions where we know these people are being educated with an assumption that they will leave. So this is something to be tackled. One particular thing that is related to the Western Balkans is statistics. We actually have no idea what we're talking about here. Numbers are so, so deteriorated to the point of depending on a source if you look at the World Bank, if they're, you, because they're, they're following the remittances, you will get certain levels of statistics. If you look at, look at the local statistics, you will get numbers of deregistrations, given that people do not necessarily deregister unless they want a second set of citizenship. So in Boston example, I think it's a case in point, you have in the last three years only 12,000 people deregistered. According to the Boston official government, there are only 12,000 people leaving or left the country. But if you talk to, to the agencies and institutions and, 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 and uh, non-governmental organizations on the ground, they will give you a statistic of 100,000. So you see there is a gap. Um, then you have Eurostat that I think is well placed actually to synchronize the whole thing, but it, it's, it, this is not being done yet. And also countries, let's be honest also towards the Western Balkans, countries are not necessarily geared towards calculating who is outside, but rather who is inside. So censuses will be the, the primary thing. Where I have found really interesting examples with your agency in Cork is household and administrative surveys that are rather cheap, could be attached to the censuses, and could be actually giving some better numbers like labor survey uh, uh, surveys that you're also doing. So in, in, in fact, there are lots and lots of lots of things that we can um, take a positive twist on and, and di discuss immigration or high levels of immigration in the Western Balkans in a somewhat different way because I think Presently, it's very one-dimensional. 
it's the pictures of people at the bus stations leaving, it's weeping mothers, it's no return, and it's, it's a cat catastrophic disaster, it's international hysteria. At the same time, we have to think about gains, transfer of knowledge. We ourselves are not on the technological frontier. Being in connection with people who are also means that you can get some potential into the country. Um, uh, remittances are definitely an important factor, but not only. I mean, we shouldn't focus on it at all. We should get to know our diaspora. This is one thing that I've learned from Ireland. Research, research, research. As we speak, there are probably like three other studies being done. And the last, I was, last time I was there, uh, you have been developing a study, consultancy study on barriers for the immigrants yeah. or actually those that are interested in return. This is something that is not happening in this region. We have no such, I mean, to some extent, but not top down. Governments are not necessarily putting this as their focal point and as their priority, apart from, from institutes and, and researchers like ourselves. So these things, um, one, if, if, we take, if, we, if we decide to sort of uh, shift a little bit priorities ourselves, I think there is a loss of potential and not talking about numbers, but Western Balkans is, is, is conservative number of diaspora is six million. And out of those, are probably there are two Chuck Fins. So yes, I think there is a lot of potential there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alida. Your mention of um, outreach to academia, for Croatia, we can at least say that there are programs in place, um, the Unity Through Knowledge Fund and New Felpro, which have actually done this for over a decade, and I think with mixed success, but at least some success, and um, in some of the institutions, we do have returnees, and we have uh, joint research projects, but it's maybe in an infant state, as you are saying. Remus, how is the situation in Romania and um, what would you be able to share with us concerning both diaspora strategy and actual return migration of, or re and circular migration? Does it happen? Is it, can it be tracked? And how does it feed in the local development? Yeah, um, thank you. I, I was, I mean, starting from Martin's speeches, I started to think about um, how do you perceive, how do we perceive migration, diaspora, and return? And I also, I was backing on my experiences from Romania. Uh, and uh, one of the issues is that very often countries of origin think of migration in terms of getting something, right? So as, a, as somebody coming and it's a, it's a, it's a catcher, right? You, you are receiving remittances, it saves your financial problems. Um, I think one, th one, one, one way to go about it is to, to transfer, to, to change the position from somebody receiving to a kind of collaborator to migrants. Uh, this is something that very often states don't do. I'm coming from a country that was during communism, migration was something very bad. Then Romania was in a stage of receiving remittances. And then uh, right now they are thinking about lose, I mean, solving the problems generated by migration. Secondly, all these policies, I mean, Romania have seen in the past years a lot of, uh, I mean, demographic decay, entire regions of the country being depopulated, a lot of brain drain. We talk about one of the largest I mean, migratory populations in Europe, 3.54 million people out of the single country. Um, and people started to complain, of course, as you, as you mentioned already. Um, but we have to think about, on, the second point is to, to, to reconceptualize the notion of return that return is not necessarily the person coming and remaining forever in the country of origin, but the person that can come and back the second time or return back to the country of origin. So we have to understand that migration is a flexible process. It's not something settled. It's not something that people are coming and leaving and returning forever. And states should adapt to that. And policies, not just at the national level, but also at the local level, are fundamental in doing it. So the notion of return and what return brings to the countries of origin is important. And third is a texture. When we talk about diaspora in involvement, diaspora, I mean, enhancing diaspora, we talk about the social texture. We talk about bringing people or the otherwise attracting people somehow. You gave the example of philanthropists. I come from Romania with the example of returnees. I mean, the largest Romanian business at the moment, it's, it's a one guy who was in Silicon Valley returned to Romania, has a very small company in a block of flats in a communist part of Bucharest, and now he's the largest Romanian company working in automatization processes. So we, we basically we have to adapt the kind of migration, return diaspora to the trends and dynamics of the global economy. And this is something a bit more difficult, but at the same time, 
countries, as Martin said, should enhance that and not intervene strongly. Um, thirdly, and I think it's a kind of plea for the future, um, return to Romania or the Romanian state didn't focus only on, I mean, the effects of migration were widely debated in the country. But at the same time, uh, the country started to receive immigrants. So in a country with strong out-migration, there will be also immigration. And we have to understand ourselves, not as a national container, as we've been for 25, 30 years of communism, but as also as countries that will transform through immigration also. So to ad have to adapt to this variety and basically multi-ethnicity that will come. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, the dynamics of um, re and circular migration are actually blurring together with immigration, regional immigration dynamics, but also international immigration. Is there something else um, from Romania you could share with us? How does this correlate with um, economic growth, recovery? Are there good examples or are there examples for regions where it doesn't work at all? Um. That took, took it to things to talk about. Um, there were many people in the 90s coming, trying to come from Germany to Romania back to invest. But the context matters. So mm -hmm. they came and failed. So whenever we talk about diaspora engagement and return, we also have to consider those who fail and to understand why did they fail. Mm -hmm. So the context matters and it's important for them to have something constant to, to rely on. Um, secondly, uh, starting from the Romanian I mean, context, but we also, we see it also in other parts of Europe. We live in, a, in, in societies that are transforming, where inequality and regional inequality is very much increasing. So in the same country, we see very poor rural hinterland and 40, 50 kilometers away of Ibron city offering everything. So from my research, I've seen that more kind of settled return occur where economic development was. It could be a kind of intuitively we think that it is true, right? We will go in this direction. So basically, um, yeah, I, I think return is much more uneven process. It doesn't occur, occur everywhere the same. If we want to save the problem, I don't know, in split, and you have the growth in Zagreb, uh, perhaps this won't go in split, but will work only in Zagreb, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so more kind of nuanced understanding, on the one hand, of the effects of migration, but at the same time, on, on the current and future processes that will go on, right? Um, and I live in a city that it's, in, I mean, it's very strong internal migration, but also return, it's, it's particularly mm -hmm. strong. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very intriguing. Alida has pointed out, uh, you've pointed out the importance of knowledge and of research, and also you've been uh, stressing this several times just to know about um, what's going on. Concerning Croatia, I'm happy that so many uh, colleagues here in the room are actually also researching such dynamics. So we have quite a strong um, body of, yes. but of course, not sufficient and needs much more to, do, to be done. But what do we know about the main obstacles today to return? I would like to get your perspective, then also yours, Alida. First, First uh, Professor Russell already mentioned uh, the main obstacle. People have formed lives in the diaspora. And uh, if you put the patriotism aside and everything, you still, if one of the, the, if one part member of the family returns to Croatia, a child, a grown member of, I don't know, 20 or 30 years old, he leaves his sister, he, leaves, he is leaving his mother, who, is, who was once a foreigner, and who, uh, whose whole family is in the diaspora country. And she is again uh, sending her child to be a foreigner in his home, in her homeland. It's a very uh, psychological, it's very uh, a hard process. And that's the first obstacle, uh, the, uh, the families that are uh, built in the diaspora countries. Uh, and the second uh, obstacle, even when we pass through that psychological ba barrier, is uh, the, uh, I would say the state, uh, the administration, uh, the, um, uh, the the different way of doing a business, and uh, that's why I said it in the the first question. Uh, 
in the last few years, uh, things are changing in Croatia. The uh, presence of multinational companies is bigger and bigger. Uh, that is a business frame which is more common and familiar to the diaspora, uh, diaspora members. So uh, when international business comes in the, the, to Croatia, when it came to Croatia and when it um, blooms as it has in the last few years, it's also uh, uh, a motive for the, di uh, for, the, for the professionals from the diaspora to come and try. It's not obligating, uh, as you said, uh, it's a, a circular. Uh, migration, mm -hmm. but it has uh, it has better chances of uh, the final of return than it uh, than if uh, the only initiatives for in the business circles are from the state or the local businesses uh, or the regional or the state businesses. Mm -hmm. Alida, how do you see the matter? More obvious and less obvious reasons why people want to return. Most obvious are the ones attached to the socioeconomic preconditions. So if you're a doctor and if you're living in Croatia, you earn a certain amount of money and you're living in certain standards. But if you uh, if you do the same job in Ireland, you will probably get more money and you will have a little bit different setting in which you operate in because your overwork hours will be or extra hours will be actually paid. Uh, 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 the safety net is somewhat different. Less obvious reasons are related to how people feel in their own country. If you look at the indexes, if you look at the uh, regional council, uh, corporation council uh, survey that, that is being done every year, huge numbers, huge percentages of people feel dissatisfied. And this is why they want to leave. They feel frustrated because high levels of corruption. They feel that their religious freedoms are being threatened. They feel that they have no... Um, power over what's happening in their governments. They have no say in how the country is being created and how the country is being moderated. Um, all these reasons are difficult to pin down because there are no right surveys that, are, that can be done in, in order to, to, to provide exact numbers. But the feeling overwhelmingly is there. Mm. Like 40% of, of people from Bosnia want to leave and never return. Mm. This is a big problem. We have to do something about it and in a way that we make these countries more livable for these people. So if you see that nothing is happening, if you see that your judiciary is not delivering as it's supposed to be delivering, then you feel that you're not safe. And that kind of safety is extremely sophisticated. It's, it's, it's extremely difficult to, to measure it, but it's definitely present. Western Balkans is, is especially uh, tricky and, and very complex because you have six countries that are trying to become European members. And this process is going on for 20 years. There are people that are now 20 and in their early 30s that are still waiting for something to happen. And the option is really easy. The choices are, are actually quite important there. Either you're going to wait another 30 years or you're going to leave now. If you look at the socioeconomic uh, indicators, World Bank report says the following. If we continue to grow, and Croatia is not also a, a, a far away from the story, if we continue to grow with the same growth rate since 2001, we're going to converge with the European Union level in 60 years' time. 60 years' time. This is a more, more optimistic version. Less optimi optimistic version is 200 years. Mm. So you have to put numbers in place. It's not growing. It, the, even with the growth level of 6%, we would question what would happen. European perspective is not there. Even if it's there, there is a, this, this uh, overwhelming myth that you know, once we get into the European Union, once the six countries get into the European Union, everything will be quick, uh, quickly fixed overnight. This is not true, and Croatia is a point, point in case, because Croatia um, experienced departure of more than 200,000 people since its membership. Since 2013, so people are leaving. You cannot keep, keep people just by promising them European values and dreams if they're not actually there in the country. And I think we should be discussing more honestly and more profoundly these sophisticated reasons and, and for, for people leaving but also not returning. And I would here just like to add that, that circular migration is one of the things that I'm also trying to propagate, if you will, and, 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 and I'm trying to, to, to pursue it in a way that people understand that not everyone will return, it's fine. People don't have to return, it's human mobility. I mean, this is one of the, the core points of the, 
of, of the EU, if you will. But we can attract people in different ways, in different shapes. If they can come and give a talk, it's already something. If they can come and spend a couple of months at the, at the hospital, in the hospital, and, and doing some amazing work that we haven't seen so far in the region, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. These kind of things should be encouraged, and I think then we, we get to the point of discussing it properly. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a, a rather um, dark uh, picture you were <laughs> sketching, which we should acknowledge that uh, it is uh, something to be tackled and to be addressed. Mm. Maybe we also sometimes can look at positive experiences, and you have a global experience yeah, yeah. also from transformation contexts which are not in the European context. What could we take from, uh, from there? And does diaspora outreach actually matter to the issues that um, Alida was now pointing out, or is this um, on no, a look, I mean, look, I, I'm quite a simple beast, you know, behind it all. Don't overthink this stuff. You know, I think it's important. Let, let's come back to two or three comments. Right? I think first question you have to answer internally is why are we engaging them? And have a very clear answer to why we want to engage our diaspora, right? Because then you start with a blank canvas. So research is incredibly important, right? The Irish government has invested in research, and particularly when you talk about issues of barriers, whether they're attitudinal, structural, so on. Where are your diaspora going to feel most comfortable telling you those issues? It's not going to be in an embassy. It's not going to be in a consulate. Yeah. So how are you going to get them to a comfortable point of helping you? Look, I'll share a story from the work that we did with the Irish government. You know, we have a lot of vulnerable people in, in the Irish diaspora. And what I'm most proud of in the Irish diaspora story is not the FDI story. We can bore you to death with that. <laughs> We can tell you a hundred stories of Coca-Cola, Intel, Facebook, Microsoft. We can tell you those stories. But what I'm most proud of is how we engage our vulnerable members of the diaspora mm -hmm. through the Immigrant Support Program. So when we were doing that research in Boston, I knew if I held a workshop in the Boston consulate, they're not going to come through the front door, the people that are most vulnerable, because they're nervous. Right? So ironically enough, being Irish, there's an Irish bar just down the road from the embassy, went in, got talking to the barmaid, and I said, I need to talk to the people that are most vulnerable, the undocumented Irish. So it was through her <laughs> that I got to go down and meet those people. Mm. Right? So research is important. So when you answer the question of why you're engaging them, because to engage them to find out that research is a fundamentally different engagement for economic development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So you have to figure out why. And this is just a, a fact of life, <laughs> whether we like it or not particularly if you go back into the economic development side of things and so on and so forth, and you mentioned multinationals and the business, the culture of doing business and so on and so forth. I say this as somebody who as worked as an entrepreneur as well. Nobody wakes up with a natural inclination to give you their money. The world does not work like that. And so, what the yeah. world does not wake up with a natural inclination to give you their money. So you have to work at it. So there's a bit of a confusion, I would argue, in the sector as well, is that we see this diaspora as a community. And they are, they are communities, but, but who do they have around them? You know, your diaspora for economic development can become tipping agents. And this is where I can tell you the stories of FDI. Diaspora members sometimes are happy to leverage the institutional wealth and connections around them rather than their individual wealth <laughs> and connections mm -hmm. to help you on your road ahead, because it's a way of testing you to see if the system is ready. So let's take company X. You have somebody in Croatia, relatively senior executive position, Croatian diaspora working for them. If there's a viable investment opportunity in Croatia, it might be that you target them for company X <laughs> rather than the individual themselves. So it, it's about, as I say, driving all this is why. And then start with a blank canvas and think of it as your board. Who do you need around the table to execute this? And I want to stand up for government here, right? I know that might be popular in a lot of rooms, but I want to stand up for government. Governments cannot do this alone. And the really good governments that do this well realize that very early. Right? They need researchers. They need the community organizations if they're dealing with, with, with the vulnerable people. They need the business networks if they're dealing with the, the C-suite level people. So you need to figure out, and, and think of it, I, I mentioned it earlier, I didn't want to push too hard because we're not there yet. We need to professionalize it. Mm -hmm. You know, We need to hire talented people and pay them well. That's why we do regular in our business. People say to me, how are you successful in business? Hire talented people, pay them well, 
and the business, if it's good enough, tends to look after itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I wouldn't overthink it. <laughs> Can I just add one thing? Uh, I think this is super interesting because there are also push factors around that, that we haven't really talked about, but I think it's really important. In the Western Balkan case, and here's me joining you in this standing up for the government, the reason why is that governments are really limited to some extent in what they can deliver. And the reason why they're, they're especially uh, vulnerable and, and limited in the Western Balkans is that you have big economies that are aging and pulling these people very aggressively into their, into their yard. And mm -hmm. here I'm sp especially talking about Germany. I'm talking about Slovakia, I'm talking about Austria, I'm talking about all the countries that are surrounding the region that really are in need of doctors, nurses, teachers, engineers, IT specialists, whoever. And if you look at their projection, how many old people will they, they will have in, in 20, 30 years' time, it makes perfect sense that there are limitations on this side to keep people at home, because what they offering is, of course, a little bit better than, than at home. And this is something I think it, it's a part of the European context. Mm -hmm. If you know that the Western Balkans is standing uh, uh, in, in, in a sort of vacuum in between, if you know that there is an exodus happening, and if you know that these people are needed in order to rejuvenate country and actually make it more energetic, I think it's in interest of the European countries, such as Germany, to actually balance its own sort of uh, 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 policies regarding in getting people into the country and regarding immigration policies. Yeah. At, at the moment, you have ministers that are openly saying that they want all Bosnians, Albanians basically coming and, and, and acting as nurses and doctors. But this is not, this is going to backfire at one point, certainly, if, if it continues this way. So I think this is and also. This might, be, this might be a controversial comment, but uh, it was put to me a couple of weeks ago. Somebody had a great line. <laughs> They say that the best and the brightest leave. So what does that tell you about the people who stayed? <laughs> <laughs> right? it's, it's a controversial comment, but you it think... No, no, brain drain is, is a really bad, bad way to put it because it implies that all those that are staying have no brain, mm. right? Yeah. It's it's really bad way to put it. But this is maybe also part of our um, task to professionalize the debate a little bit and also yeah. to look into who has actually been coming back because these yeah. are very bright and successful people who actually put maybe career considerations aside and still returned or decided to come and so on. But however, it's very important that you point out the cohesion challenge for the whole of the European Union. So do um, such labor um, recruitment programs that Germany has very tar targeted immigration um, policies actually backfire in the long run if we are losing the doctors and IT specialists in other parts of Europe. So is convergence actually rather in 200 years happening than in 60 years if this is continuing like that. So it's a transnational debate we have to conduct. I would like to open the floor now for questions. And um, you have a moment to think. No, there's no more thinking. You have been thinking. So I take the first question, please, here on the floor. Say briefly who, who you are and who your question or comment goes to. And I don't represent anyone, just myself, you know, I'm not here from the institution. I have two questions, one for Dr. Russell and one for Croatiana, and I, I will start with Croatiana. Uh, can you tell us about numbers of returnees and the average age of the do those people who return to Croatia? No, unfortunately, uh, the Croatian legal system, the uh, Croatian laws, have um, uh, a problem with uh, registers and uh, immigration and emigration uh, yeah. balance uh, uh, registration. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, we can only talk about the uh, volume of work in our welcoming office, which is mm -hmm. a part of the State Office for uh, Creations Abroad that handles uh, all returnee and potential returnee uh, communication with the governments, uh, with ministries, local governments, uh, in every area which is of their interest when uh, they are in the pr uh, procedure of return. Uh, so we do not have classic numbers. Because it's, the, it's the same problem with uh, immigration. We do not have, uh, we don't have good numbers in, uh, as Alida said, in that uh, 
uh, in that uh, uh, field also because the state uh, uh, the uh, state registers uh, and the Croatian diaspora when uh, they have uh, the uh, uh, they have their uh, uh, so they have their address in Croatian in the Croatian uh, legal system in Croatia although they live outside of Croatia. Double residency. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so they, it's really hard to uh, uh, register when they have returned since their address is continuity mm -hmm. in, con uh, in continuity the same. So that's the, re uh, the, the problem with the legal system with uh, registering mm -hmm. the return or uh, the emigration outside of Croatia. So you cannot say about the average job. Uh, uh, no, I think we can, talk, know, uh, yeah. uh, we can talk about the volume of work in our uh, registry, uh, in our welcoming office, and we have registered uh, that the number of, of uh, Croatians, uh, returnees, has uh, multiplied in the last two years, uh, two times. And okay. do we know about every the age, age, every age. Every age. I'm sorry, yeah. I haven't yeah. heard. Uh, the age, the, uh, there are the students from the Croaticum program. It's a university course for the Croatian language. And as a rule, uh, if people uh, go to two semesters, it, there is a possibility of two, three, or four semesters. Uh, students who uh, go to two, uh, take two semesters on Croatian universities to learn the Croatian, they usually stay. And there, the, uh, it's a student uh, age, about mm -hmm. 24, 25 after universities uh, abroad. And we have young families, uh, mainly from uh, North and La uh, South America, which are with children so it's about 25 to 35 years old Th okay. those are our most uh, recent uh, age groups we have a lot of returnees but I'm not even including them in the speech uh, we have the the, uh, the retire uh, the retirement returnees mm -hmm. uh, but they're mo mostly in, uh, in terms of the office they're mostly interested in the uh, tax system and uh, we just had a big uh, tax reform, two, two or three circles, and the taxes are really lower on their pensions, uh, so they are uh, more motivated. Uh, motivated, but that, that was their only uh, need for uh, talking to the office and getting assistance. Mm -hmm. So okay, thank you. And now for Dr. Russell. Uh, what do you think about giving diaspora political rights, for example, right to vote? And <laughs> is it in the category of do or do not to diaspora? <laughs> and as far as I know, uh, Ireland doesn't facilitate, you know, that right. And uh, I, as an Irish citizen, cannot cannot vote here, for example, and as a Croatian citizen, I can vote in our embassy in, in Dublin, you know, of, mm. when we have elections. So you, want, you want to get me in trouble, right? <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it's obviously on the agenda to come up in Ireland in terms of a referendum. Um, my, my honest and quick answer to it is, I think the debate in Ireland could be quite messy. Uh, I, think it, I think it will unearth a lot of tensions that, that are bubbling beneath the surface in terms of diaspora engagement. And, and this is the beauty and the challenge of how the Irish define the diaspora. You know, and it ties into something that will definitely get me in trouble when I say it, so I'm warning people before I say it. The, the biggest challenge for diaspora engagement going forward inside Ireland and outside Ireland is that word called migration. That is the biggest challenge for diaspora engagement. Mm -hmm. Migration and diaspora are different. So I'm a big believer that migration is the language of borders and identity, mm -hmm. but diaspora is the language of belonging and affinity. Mm -hmm. Right? So they're two different beasts. They're almost like first cousins. Mm -hmm. So I'm coming back to the question, don't worry. I'm not ducking out of it. I think in Ireland we've, had, we've developed an incredibly inclusive definition of our diaspora. When you talk about 70 million. The global Irish. The global Irish, right? But when you talk about extending political rights and voting rights, it will need a different definition. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the challenge will come. And what definition would it be? 
it will be Did tied you think to, of it? It will be tied to passport holders and citizenship as, as far as it, where it stands in terms of legislation at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think that will also cause a lot of tension in the communities out there, particularly where, and the Irish model is, is different in the sense that we have an incredibly mature diaspora. Our diaspora has developed over centuries. So I think in the US, the last household survey was like 34.5 million pick the Irish American box. But I believe we've only 100,000 Irish in America. Right? So they are two different communities. So I'll, I'll, I'll put my neck in the line. I, I'll be voting no. no. Um, you know, and that's my, my honest opinion on it. I think there'll be a lot more people will vote no than we think. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not looking forward to that debate. Because, and the reason why I say no, when you look at what happens globally on it, what tends to happen is that the lobby for the vote tends to be a lot stronger than the turnout for the vote. And that's where my concern would be. So I will direct you to, I wrote research on this in 2011. I haven't updated it since. It's available for free, so you get a sense of my opinion in that piece <laughs> without explicitly saying it. Like, so I don't know if that's the answer that you wanted. Thank you. It's an answer. <laughs> okay, thanks. We have uh, in the last row someone who would like to take the mic. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bruno Rukavina, and I'm from Ministry of Internal Affairs, and I actually enjoy this topic, and I actually read a lot about it, since my generation is, many, many people from my generations actually left the country and emigrated in other countries. So first of all, I have two questions. One is, what can Croatia actually do or should do uh, to be more attractive, or to not only for diaspora, but for the other peoples also, like Irish people even, or Germans, or others, uh, to come and live here, or at least to have some kind of connections with people. Is there any smart power that we can do? Perhaps, the, you said it yourself, the perfect work and life balance. And second question is about that drain draw that we talk about from Croatia, although it, it is a term that is used, sorry if it's not the correct one. Uh, well, but that dra brain draw, drain, uh, I actually wanted to leave the country in one moment, and I wanted to find a job somewhere else. But men with but, but people with my qualifications, like from social studies, cannot find the jobs in the studies in what they actually learn from in other countries. Not that easily, anyways. So my question is, how many people actually that went out work the job they, which they studied? Mm -hmm. Not just doctors or like uh, technicians. Thank you very much. Who's the question for? Oh, yeah, uh, everyone, actually, anyone. Everybody, who would like to who answer? Who would answer? Like Thank you. Take it. Uh, Anybody you? is... Uh, I've spoken uh, a lot, so... <laughs> no, no, well, what Yeah, no, look, do? yeah, yeah. Look, in, ter in terms of, of, of what Croatia can do to be more attractive, and I don't know if our colleague from Australia is still here, but there was a former Australian Prime Minister who had a great line, and he said, um, in the great race of life, back self-interest, because at least you know it'll be trying. All right? So I think you have to figure out within your global community what networks are important to people, right? And across, we meant, we've hinted at it across the panel, but I'm a big believer that life cycles are really important in this, right? So people that are at different stages of their lives will have different motivations and so on and so forth. So that's one thing that Croatia can do. We can invest in them. You know, an investment doesn't necessarily mean financial. The role of embassies and consulates, they have a convening power. They, they have, they're normally the first point of contact for diaspora communities. So I would say build the community infrastructure out there and add value to their life out there, right, before you begin to engage. Another area that's becoming really interesting, and I think our colleague from Romania hinted at it, is, you know, we talk about the Croatian diaspora. I have no doubt that the people living abroad from Croatia are really interested in where they're from in Croatia, not necessarily the nation. So I'm from Ireland, but I really care about Cork. When I was living abroad, I wanted investment to go back to the place where I'm from. So locality and what people think about you and your nation brand and your place brand is really important. So if you want a little example of how this plays out, you know, there's an incredible city in Denmark called Copenhagen, right? And everybody smiles when you say Copenhagen because it's edgy, design, people love it. So Copenhagen had a really simple idea a couple of years ago, or 20 years ago at this stage to create what they call the Copenhagen Goodwill Ambassadors Program. So this is an invite-only network of 50 to 70 people, a relative success across different disciplines, so academics and social sciences, 
to your CEOs, to your artists, to your cultural curators, invite-only network, and their only job is to promote Copenhagen abroad, wherever they are. So previously, he's moved now, but the previous Copenhagen Goodwill Ambassador in Dublin was the CEO of Volkswagen, really powerful guy. So whilst he was in there in Dublin, working for Volkswagen, he really had a Copenhagen hat on. So that can happen for any city, it can happen for any country. And this comes back to the question of why you're engaging them. Think, just answer this question, and you don't have to answer it now. Answer it when you sit around the table. What are we asking them to do? And if you don't have a very simple, clear answer to that, they're never going to understand it. So think about what you're asking. So I think that's what Croatia can do. What people think about you is important. So, so your, brand, your, your brand is important. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ramos, do you have any uh, f suggestions or uh, how does Romania deal with it? Is there a sense of locality? Are there people connected to the local communities? Is tourism or a tourism industry actually trying to cater that kind of branding uh, need for a uh, country yeah, um, in the diaspora? Yeah, I wanted to say about two things because they were raised here and also this one. Uh, what is going on there is in the southern Transylvania emerging a sort of branding Mm -hmm. um, and we had a situation of former ethnic Germans from Romania who left this place and uh, they left uh, medieval fortresses and cities. And what we see is that despite the fact that they went to Germany 30 years ago with the clear decision not to return, their institutions are very lively and they go regularly back and two years ago there are 20,000 people going to Sibiu, Hermannstadt just to, 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 to go to, to celebrate. There is a genuine interest of people towards their place of origin because it is about their own lives, right? So this mm -hmm. understanding of belonging, it's very important. And it is not something marginal, it's something central for everybody. So uh, from here on, it depends very much on the assuredness of very many governments and of context, right? Um, a second thing that was raised here also related with the brain drain and migration. Um, we usually tend to think that states can do many things but the whole literature of migration says that there is an autonomy of migration in itself. This migration becomes a self-autonomous, self-perpetuating process, and very often states cannot do too much. So we have to understand these limitations and we have, and also the opportunities that we have. And combining both of them, we can go on a little bit farther. And also was a discussion about the brain drain. You also experience, but some people are going abroad and they return. Sometimes the return of these people may be more important than the, the, the migration of 20 others, you know? So we don't always have to think in, in <coughs> big categories, yeah. black and white. Mm -hmm. the, the, the reality is much more diverse. And there is another one point. The positive effects of migration don't come today or tomorrow. They can come in two, three, four years' time, right? Uh, we don't have to rush it. We have also to let also these processes settle a little bit and then to, to see how we can tap into it and what mm -hmm. to do with it. Mm -hmm. right? We cannot force because if we force them, we, we come with something artificially sometimes. Mm -hmm. So we have to let this genuine interest for the country, the genuine interest and relationship to parents, to friends, to, to the places we've been to grow, to grow old, and then also to act accordingly. So mm -hmm. that would be That's actually important. I don't know if this answers the question, you know, but. I like to tell stories to get the point across. A chap recently spoke to me about how a government can help diaspora engagement, and he's a member of the diaspora. And he said they can do two things. Give us attention and give us an ear. And he said the second part is to make sure that the engagement reflects the reality of our community. That's free. That costs you nothing. Right? And if you look at trends within migration as well, for example, we haven't mentioned it so far, but particularly in vulnerability, Familial re reunification through migration. Gender is incredibly important in this. Mm -hmm. Figuring out you know, issues of vulnerability and successful gender diaspora is really important. You know, and that's something we're working on in Ireland actively. You know, I want to pick up, I don't know if I mentioned at the beginning, what the board I sit on is the future of work and women. We have enough men in leadership positions. We need more women, right? So those, keep that as your pillar. Attention and an ear and also make sure that the engagement reflects the reality of the community. Mm -hmm. May I just also add something? Yeah. I think, going back to your question, I think it really depends how willing the governments are to actually attract people back home. Because 
at the moment, I actually don't see any government in the region that is really, really trying very hard to, to, to bring back people home. As you said, trust is a main issue, and trust is, is definitely missing because these people feel um, very much frustrated with the country. They feel unjust. They feel uh, the things that are happening, they simply don't want to tolerate them because the, why would they? If they're young and smart and skilled, why would they actually choose to come back in a country that doesn't really provide for that? So I think in order to, to, to actually do that, in order to, to make return possible, even in circular migration, we have to open up a very sincere and very, very um, open debate and actually make a commitment that we want to improve things on the ground. One thing that hasn't been mentioned, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's super important, is Celtic Tiger. I mean, economic mm. miracle that the Ireland experienced brought people back, but not only Irish people. Mm. If I remember correctly, only last year you had a small surplus of, of citizens coming back. Yeah. It's yeah. not about Irish coming back. It's about attracting talents, people from everywhere. And in order for that to happen, they will always think, choosing between the two. Do I go into, into a country that cannot offer me a, a safe and just processes in judiciary? That can, that, that where, that, do I have to fight administration if I want to set up a business? Do I uh, enjoy all my religious and, and, and all other rights? If the answers are no, you will not attract any talents. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. there, there's an old joke in Ireland that somebody shot the tiger. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's limping down the main street. <laughs> Ramos, you also wanted to comment on yeah, this. I wanted to tap on, on, mm -hmm. on Martin's comment on gender. Uh, there was a very good research on Romania on um, women returnees, and one of their main problems returning back to Romania is that they experience in the West more equalitarian gender relations. While returning to Romania, they have to fall back with them same patriarchal relations. So one way to address, I mean, women are very important mm. I mean, gen, uh, agents of return or migration. You have to convince women that they can return into a bit better context, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not to fight with the same problems and with the same inequality on the labor market and in families. Graziana? Mm -hmm. Well, um, in Croatia, uh, what we can do uh, to help diaspora return or, or immigration to Croatia generally, uh, is to continue with the economic development of the country. That is something that is uh, primary uh, to uh, the uh, life uh, and uh, to stop uh, the emigration from Croatia. So it's the, the, prim the primary uh, way to fight uh, or the, to attract uh, immigration and fight emigration. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second is to continue the great branding that happened accidentally to Croatia. Uh, the tourism boom and the sport boom and everything that is connected to uh, not just the sea uh, coast uh, but uh, to continental Croatia and we are having also a lot of initiatives in that uh, department from the diaspora. Um, the, the diaspora uh, is involved in the Croatian tourism and the promotion of Croatian uh, diverse uh, parts of the Croatian tourism, like the wedding, um, like wedding destinations, like uh, wineries, uh, regions uh, as Slavonia, Ilok, the, uh, the Lika, and. That's a way to get, they know Croatia, diaspora, the diaspora knows Croatia, and they know the niches that are not uh, developed enough, and they know what the potential, because they are, uh, they are uh, from uh, Western states that are more developed, and they know the potential of these niches. So that's something that we have been tracking in the last few years, and we are very happy to see that. Uh, the same thing is not happening uh, only with the diaspora, it's happening with uh, other nat uh, na native uh, nationals. And uh, it's just, uh, Croatia is really specific, and I don't want to seem uh, too proud of my country, but. Uh, everything that is happening in Croatia uh, in the last couple of years, uh, it is uh, related to the European Union. Uh, the, uh, I'm sure the, uh, use, uh, using the uh, freedom of movement is something that is happening, but as uh, Mr. Oreshkovic, uh, have I heard? 
I'm sorry, Mr. Oreshkovic. Rukavina, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Rukavina said uh, the immigration of uh, uh, the immigration of the Croatian people from uh, as uh, uh, the, from the usement uh, for from using the freedom of movement, uh, they do not do the jobs that they were uh, educated for. So when they come back and if Croatia continues the econo economic development it has started, um, that is a motive plus to return. So because they will be uh, with new uh, skills that they have obtained outside their education, but they will, uh, they could use it in Croatia after their return. We um, will now have to close uh, the list. I have one more, I've seen one more hand, and this is the last call. No more? Zvonimir Milas, please. The last question. Please take the microphone. Sorry, I'm also not representing any institution, but I'm a returnee to Croatia. So, <laughs> Uh, but I have a question. I do not know who to ask, either the gentleman from Romania or the gentleman from Ireland. But you, but both countries have uh, the same, uh, are experiencing this phenomena. Uh, Ireland uh, with a larger hist uh, with a longer history. So what we have in Croatia is now uh, we had a wave after we entered. We, after, after we entered the European Union, we had a wave of recent migration, work migration. And the main country of migration was Germany, is Germany. And, uh, and uh, at the same time, after a long period of recession, which lasted in Croatia for six years, uh, Croatia's economy uh, started to grow. And we had also a, a, a growth of real wages in 19, 19, uh, in 2017, it was 5%. In 2018, 4%. And in 2019, it's going to be 3%. At the same time, we had immigration to Croatia through work perm permits for non-EU uh, citizens, for EU foreigners. And these uh, work permits were increasing for, uh, each year to a higher level. So this year we have already 85,000 work permits, which is roughly 5% of the workforce. How did Ireland cope with it to have, uh, to have uh, strong growth rates, still, grow, uh, still a strong uh, increases in real wages, and, and uh, attracting both uh, Irish people and, uh, and, um, and uh, foreigners to Ireland. And in Romania, you have even stronger real growth wages than Croatia. I think you are the number one in the European Union in the recent years. Uh, is it the case that attracting, uh, uh, do, do um, increasing wages uh, start to attract people to, uh, to get back to Romania. Thank you. Thank you. So, who takes first? Oh, you can go. There's, there's a PhD thesis in this, thesis in this but we'll, we'll come back to that. You, you, have, two, <laughs> you have two minutes yeah, yeah. to oh, okay. answer that question. Look, I can, I can, go, I can go first. Yeah. Uh, you, you go first. Mike. I, I can go first if it's easier. Uh -huh. Look, it depends on the type of employment you're talking about. Um, and what we also have seen in Ireland is very much a regional variation. So particularly a lot of people that have emigrated into Ireland from non-Irish have gone to Dublin working for certain companies, you know, major multinational companies that have the workforce and, and demand to fill them. You know, the biggest challenge you have on, that, on the social front, and it's beginning to bubble in Ireland, is, is that issue of difference between those communities. So I see it as an incredibly rich diversity to Ireland. And I give an example in Dublin. I think the, at the national level, the last census, I think the, the non-Irish population was like 17%. I'm standing to be corrected on that. Yeah, 17 to 20%. The previous census before that, I think it was like 4 to 5%. So you see this growth realistically within it. But within Dublin, for example, you know, it's now, I think it's 33% of people living in Dublin are not from Ireland. So if you want to know the, the trend in that, if you want to know the decision makers that matter in Dublin in the next 15 to 20 years, very few of them will have Irish surnames. And that's a good thing, by the way. That's a good thing, right? 
So I think it comes back to the type of employment and making sure that the opportunities are there to sustain it. Now, there will be societal issues that come with that, right? Because pe people are creatures of habit and creatures of comfort, and they will see that difference as a challenge to what they see. But I see this as something incredibly rich. I don't know if that answers your question in total, but within two minutes is the best I got. <laughs> yeah. Famous. I, I try to be even shorter. I mean, I we have to consider the duality of the market. So the Romanian mig migrant who was working in agriculture don't no longer return necessarily as an uh, agricultural worker. Or the person working in construction will try better to become a small entrepreneur than a worker. So they only need the other workers. And what we see, at least in the Romanian case, uh, almost with the naked eye, is that people started to shy away from these the, this sectors. So they tend to work something else or to go abroad. And what happens is that increasingly migrants are coming to replace them. In the past years, we've seen an increase in Moldovan immigrants, perhaps in Ukraine. I mean, at least on the Eurostat data. And, they, and they, they started to talk very much about the Vietnamese, Sri Lankans, and Indians. And um, the whole field is starting to professionalize a little bit with NGOs trying to organize them, with small manpower companies, and so on. So I think that both processes will coexist because of the dualization of the labor markets going on in the region. Mm -hmm. If I just may add, there is a danger. Very short, you Just very super tempered. short, uh, mm -hmm. because it, it triggered me be, that, that you said, and I, I have found also data on Vietnamese coming to Romania. There, are, there is a bilateral agreement currently with Romania. 3,000 people from Vietnam are coming. 30,000. 30,000. 30,000. 30,000, okay. Wow, okay. So um, the point there is, I think there is, a, there is a, a bit of a moral question, if you will, because R Romanians that are not happy with 400 euros salary or 300 euros salary are leaving the country while Vietnamese are being brought in that will work for 250 in or 300. Now in construction, in construction. Now, now in construction you, you are obliged to give a minimum salary of 650. Okay. According to last, last Ro year. Regardless of where they come. Regardless of where they come okay. from. Okay. So this is a minimum and they have to offer the minimum. And they do. They have to do. Okay. okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, first, I would like to give a big hand of applause to this panel. <laughs> the applause goes also to you for your engagement and for uh, being with us for the discussion. Thank you very much for spending Monday afternoon here. Thanks once more to Olive Hempenstahl and her engaging and bringing here um, a foreign uh, inspiration from Ireland. And uh, thank you, Remus, to come from Romania and Alida to come at the moment from Vienna to join our panel. Thank you, Croatiana, for holding the flag for the URED, which uh, is a very important institution. And um, I think it's interesting that we started off with emigration um, and diaspora, and we ended with immigration. And um, tomorrow we will deepen the debate at the conference to which you are all very warmly invited. You will find the programs outside. Take a program, pop in at the debate, because this is heavy impact of research um, on, on the issue. And now I may invite you in the name of the co-organizers and the Adenauer Foundation to join us for um, a small Domjenak. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.